tell you what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about food ways of Native Americans, but to do that I'm going to talk, I'm going to narrow the focus, and I'm going to talk about what people were eating in the distant past right here, within 50 miles of where we are, within five miles of where we are. But I'm not going to talk to you about everything they were eating, I'm going to talk to you specifically about plant foods. It's one of the concepts that we don't really get a big handle on when we think about archaeology and distant past. You're often thinking of projectile points and stone tools and what people are hunting. But what I want to tell you is that right here in Bryan College Station, for 10,000 years, really you might say for 15,000 years, people depended on deer and wild roots. And I would gather, does anyone in the room know what the roots on the top are? We'll, we'll keep this as a mystery. It looks like carrots, that's what I thought, being a farm boy, because the roots, the, the flowers kind of look like carrots. But it's not carrots, and keep that in the back of your mind, I'm going to unveil that mystery. It will not be a new plant to a single person in this room. You'll all know the plant. So, here we go. What is it about our part of the world? Our part of the world is called the post oak savanna, and used to, College Station had the symbol of a post oak as part of its logo, which I really liked because it spoke well of exactly who we are and where we are. So, what is it about the post oaks? All of those pictures are taken within 15 miles of Bryan College Station. We're in a savanna that's part grassland and part woodland. That savanna is unusually productive in wild food resources. Deer and the focus of my talk wild roots. The very first Europeans that came through here knew and talked about and described these foods in considerable detail. How long ago was the first Europeans here? More than 500 years ago. People walked within sight of the Welcome to Aggieland Tower and described what Indian people were doing here in the 1530s, maybe in the 1520s. Now that's a long time ago, even for a sixth generation Texan. So, this map is supposed to clue us in. Where are we? That's the post oak savanna, the lighter green. And that lighter green, the post oak savanna, goes from San Antonio all the way to Tyler. And as I tell my students, if you drove essentially down Highway 21 or one of the local highways close to Highway 21 from Tyler to San Antonio, one way or another, you would see the same kind of trees, the same kind of grass, the same kind of animals. The only thing that happens is the trees get shorter, but it's the same basic kind of environment where people made their living. Now, how does that compare to the rest of North America? Go over to this other map, that's where College Station is on the, on the national map of North America. College Station is much more like Atlanta, Georgia than it is like the Texas Panhandle where I grew up, and by the way, that's the heart of God's country. Is anyone in here lucky enough to have been reared in the panhandle? When I first came back to Texas, they're where in the panhandle? Level land. Level land. I know level land. You know where white deer is then. All right. Both people don't. The Texas panhandle, by the way, is just that little square part at the top, and, and that's if you're from the Panhandle, that's the Panhandle. It's not any other part of Texas, it's the Panhandle. The Canadian River flows through it. People have been living there for 15,000 years and loving it. Much better weather than the weather here. Every time I walk from a, one building to the other, I'm one of these sweaters, and I'm just soaking wet. And I cannot imagine why a person in their right mind would live here if you could live near Amarillo. <laughs> However, that's just a crazy idea. There were far more people living in Bryan College Station for the last 15,000 years than lived in Amarillo. Now, I don't know what that says for the people in Bryan College Station, but Amarillo, dry, hot, is a cool place to be. So, that's where we are. Not like the Panhandle at all, but like Eastern North America. Now, what were people eating here in general? 
in this part of the world where we are, by all records, when the Europeans first arrived, the people were maybe half their diet came from deer and rabbits, mostly deer. Few bison, hardly any bison were here when Cabeza de Vaca was here 500 years ago. The rest of the diet is made up by plant foods, predominantly roots, and just a little bit of fishing. The fishing here was never really important to the extent it was if you're farther east. But fish were an important food resource. How many people were living here at a given time? Those are just some figures, but in here, one family per 13 square miles. Now, how big is 13 square miles? That's about 3.6 miles on a side. So what is that? Uh, nine or 10 sections of land per family. And each family lived there, and that's the way it was when the Europeans first arrived. So it was fairly populated. You could climb on top of the Welcome to Aggieland water tower and count 100 houses, 100 places where families were living. Yes, sir? So tribes were really that scattered out? Yeah, well, families were scattered out. Hunters and gatherers, that's a good question. I'm going to be talking, and the distinction I'm going to make is between hunters and gatherers, people who made their living entirely from wild food, on the one hand, versus people who made their living from cultivated plants or animals. And in Texas, it's cultivated plants, and those are corn, beans, and squash, the dominant food of everyone in eastern Texas, and a lot of people in the Panhandle and some places, pe people near El Paso. But mostly farmers live in bigger villages close to rivers. Hunters and gatherers tended to live in scattered groups all about the landscape. And they often didn't camp down by the rivers at all. The first Europeans that come right through here, they invariably describe the villages that are just little like a deer hunter's camp, only instead of being a bunch of guys, it was a bunch of families. Mom, pop, and the kids, and probably the grandparents were all there with them, and they'd stay in one place for no more than a week or so, and they'd pick up and move. Highly mobile, carried everything they had on their back, and they were healthier than the average person in this room. Hunters and gatherers tended to be healthier than farmers in general. So our ancestors in the distant past were healthier than us today. One, they weren't eating so much processed food. But we'll get on with this. So what's one of the earliest counts we see up here in Bryan College Station? Right there we are in Bryan. This is a map of the first Spanish expedition, expedition with the 400 people that came into Texas. And that's De Soto, Hernando De Soto, he's coming originally from Florida, exploring the southeastern United States. He crosses the Mississippi River, he dies, and is buried in the Mississippi River, but his captain, Moscoso, leads the expedition on. And by the time they're in Louisiana and in Arkansas, they're beginning to think, wow, we're a long way from home and there's no gold. They came to Texas to the southeast to find gold. That's what Cortez had found in Mexico. That's what Pizarro had found in uh, Peru. So everybody wanted to come to America and find more gold. Pizarro brings 400, or Pizarro, De Soto brings 400 soldiers, crosses the southeast, comes into Texas, and he's running out of corn. And so with 400 people, 400 soldiers, and who it wasn't just 400 soldiers, what one of the interesting things is that one of the important concepts, here's Bryan College Station, at this Caminos Real, that's a big project now, that's the Caminos Real de los Tejas, the original King's Road going from Mexico to the Mississippi Valley, and it comes right through Bryan College Station. Many of you know it's been declared a National Historic Trail, and it's being developed. Down that trail, the reason that trail is important and the reason it's important for Bryan College Station, here it's the first time Europeans travel. And it's not just Europeans. His soldiers were made up of some enslaved African Americans. So from the get-go, and I'll tell you, even 20 years before this, the first non-Indians here were African Americans and Europeans, not just Europeans. So what do they find? Here's this army moving through, and if you picture it, they're over near Commerce, Texas, and they're trying to eat, and they've got 400 people. Well, can you send the deer hunters out to kill enough deer to feed 400 soldiers on a daily basis? 
Not a chance. Could you, could you stop and grow your crops? Could you go out and dig roots? Could you fish to feed 400 people 24-7? Not a chance. So how'd these guys eat? They stole from the Indians. And every time they came to an Indian village that was farmers, they pillaged all of their corn stores and literally stole everything and ate and executed people for not telling them where the corn was stored. But they, they coerced the corn from the Indian people. That allowed them to come almost to Crockett, stealing corn. But then when they got to Crockett and they crossed the Trinity River, they then saw in our part of the world hardly any agriculture at all, in fact none. And they began to think, how are we going to get home? Because their plan was to go through Texas to Mexico and drop down into near Mexico City by land. But if there's no corn, they can't eat. So then he sent a rider down all the way to San Antonio and another one out past Waco to see if there was any corn, and they found no corn anywhere. So DeSoto had to saddle up, if you will, turn back around, go through East Texas and Arkansas and all those ticked off Indians because they had killed their moms and their dads and their grandparents, and they had to go back through that territory. Well, the Indians were none too sanguine on that, and they killed as many Spaniards as they could getting back. These Spaniards were soldiers. And they were, they were, most of them were professional soldiers, and so they were wondering, how are we going to get home? And they, by this time, they knew you've got to go by boat. So they go back to the Mississippi River, get these guys, not one sailor among them, and they build barges on the Mississippi River, float down the Mississippi River, float out into the Gulf, come back next to the coast, and follow the Texas coastline all the way down 200 miles south into Mexico, and finally get back to Spaniards that are settling central Mexico by that time. Cabeza de Vaca, African American, and Cabeza de Vaca is coming before him, and I'm going to get to Cabeza de Vaca. So, the story here and what people are eating, right up there is Bryan College Station, never any appreciable agriculture here. People living by wild plants and foods. Other side of the Trinity River, all the way to the Atlantic Ocean, people are farming. Why is that? Why isn't there any farming here? It rains plenty, 30 inches a year. You're farming out in, in the Rio Grande Valley and in the southwest where it, it's 12 inches a year. I grew up a dry land farmer, son of a dry land farmer in the Texas Panhandle where it rains 12 inches a year. We went broke, but a lot of people, <laughs> a lot of people didn't on farming. But in any case, it's probably because the rain comes at the wrong time of the year. Where we are, the rain's pretty evenly distributed summer, spring, winter, and fall. You have to be able to count on summer rain to grow corn in Texas. And the first corn in Texas that's grown by Europeans in the San Antonio is again grown by enslaved people, Indians in this case, who were forced to build canals and irrigation ditches around the missions to farm. So, long story, getting back to Bryan College Station. Here's Cabeza de Vaca. Now I jumped ahead to DeSoto to tell you that DeSoto comes down a road, and he calls it a road, from East Texas all the way to Austin and San Antonio. It's a road, he can see it easy, they can travel right down it. He knows about Texas because Cabeza de Vaca was shipwrecked on Galveston Island in 1528, and I'll tell you, four people survive and they walk across Texas. And they get back to New Mexico, back to Mexico, and they write a book, a narrative. They're interrogated by the military, and they write a book on everything they saw between Galveston, Texas, and the Rio Grande River, and El Paso, and all the way across Mexico to Culiacan. And they tell this story, and then when DeSoto comes back, he has that book with him. So he knows what Cabeza de Vaca has seen. How did Cabeza de Vaca, who crosses this area of Texas, that's his little pathway through there. How does he know about this? Most maps don't show that, Quebec, that DeSoto came on down from the Mississippi River to Texas, but he surely did. And he probably came all the way to Austin. So what does Cabeza de Vaca have to say about Texas in this part of the world? He says here the people were strictly hunters and gatherers. Deer were the primary food resource in the terms of game animals. And the primary plants weren't pecans or berries, or uh, dewberries, or uh, what else would we see? Any kind of fruit, they were roots. And underneath the ground, 
right here in this town and within 15 miles of us, all of these roots that I'm showing you grow. They grow in very high densities. Many of the roots that I'll talk about grow in densities of more than 100 plants per square yard. Now that's a pretty dense wild root ground and the Indians were probably burning these root fields periodically to increase the productivity. So let's move ahead here. Here's Cabeza de Vaca. All that brown dot is going to start on the other side over there, he thinks. He sees the people in this general part of the world and what he says is those people in the post oaks subsisted almost entirely upon two to three kinds of roots most of the year. So that was their staple. Who else do we know that staples are roots? Think of all those people in Ireland that they had the potato famine. They were all depending on roots. And the Irish potato, by the way, isn't Irish at all. It comes from South America. There's no potatoes in Europe. No such thing as an Irish potato until Pizarro got to South America and took the potato back to Europe. And they start growing the potato in Europe. And soon enough, we call it an Irish potato. In any case, Cabeza de Vaca referred to the people here as roots people because that was their primary diet. And I'm going to come back to that. Here's that brown dot. Boom. That's Cabeza de Vaca. Quick story on Cabeza de Vaca. 400 soldiers, 1528, 1527, depart from Havana, Cuba. And they're going to be the first people that come into North America in the southeast and find the kind of gold that Cortez has been finding in, South, in Mexico and Pizarro in South America. 400 people, don't, well, half a dozen ships, and they all come to the Florida Panhandle, people disembark, go on land, and then they start moving west through the southeast. Again, they're the first ones to go through. Real quick, the Indians in the southeast in 1528 already knew the white guys and their enslaved African Americans were bad guys. And how'd they know that? They had been in Mexico, the Spanish and enslaved African Americans had been in Mexico City since 1519. So that's 10 years. And in that 10 year time period, the reputation of Europeans spread dramatically fast. And Indians knew that if white guys are coming with horses and guns, they ain't good news for us. So when De Soto and these people entered into Louisiana and, the, and Florida, they were immediately repelled by the Indians. They fought back, and by the time they got near the Mississippi River, they were down to about 200 people, 250 people out of the 400, and they said, we can't do this anymore. Let's go to the coast. So they went to the coast, and they were going to go by sea all the way down to Mexico and find Cortez. As they're doing that, they build the barges, they cross in front of the Mississippi River, but the Mississippi River current so strong, it pushes them way out into the, into the Gulf. And then they know they've got to work to get back to the coast, and they do, and that's when they land in Galveston. And there's over 200 of them that land on Galveston Island, the survivors. The first winter, half of those people die from influenza, bird flu. Swine flu, what are we calling it nowadays, H1N1? <laughs> Some kinds of influenza, all of these people die. And the Indians die and the Europeans die. The Indians want to kill the Europeans because they think the Europeans brought the disease, but other Indians tell them, and Cabeza de Vaca tells you this story in his book, one of the most fascinating books you'll ever read because it says so much about this part of the world. And he's by this time is learning to speak the Indian languages and knows right away that some of the Indians say, if the Spanish really brought this disease, would the disease be killing them? And the answer was no, so it's killing everybody equally, so let's not kill these Spaniards for bringing the disease. Most of the Spaniards die anyway. The first bit of cannibalism documented in Texas is not Karankawa Indians, which many of you have probably heard that Karankawa Indians on the coast were cannibals. Cabeza de Vaca describes the first cannibalism, and it's starving Spaniards eating dead Spaniards on Galveston Island. And Cabeza de Vaca said, had the Indians known that we were being cannibals, they would have killed us all for being witches, which tells you that the Indians weren't accustomed to people eating people. That was what the Spaniards fell into out of pure despair. The long and short is out of this expedition, four people survive. Three white guys, they're all aristocrats, and one enslaved African American, or African, a guy named Moore, a guy named Esteban, a Muslim. 
And he is, he's in Spain, and he's bought by one of the Spaniards, a guy named Dorantes, who solves this. So, Cabeza de Vaca down there at Galveston, 100 miles away. All of these Europeans become traders. And in a little bit of time, he's going from Galveston, 100 miles inland, on all kinds of trading expeditions. He comes inland to College Station and back and back and forth, and he learns this whole area all the way to San Antonio from 1528 to 1535 that he's camped on the ground living with Indians, and so are the other three uh, old world people. So they set up, and they finally decide that let's get back to Mexico. No one's killed them. The question is, why did these four guys survive? What was it about them? And I always said they told the Indians by virtue of what they were doing that they respected the Indians. And because they respected them and the Indians could sense that respect, they did not kill the whites or the African American. So all these guys gather up down near Victoria and they say, we're going back to Mexico by land, and we're going to get these Indians to walk with us and show us the way. And they do. And they head out, and they follow this pathway, and they get down to about Monterrey, and they know that they can go on to Mexico City, but they decide, we don't want to do that. We want to explore some more. And no one really knows why they explore more, but they do. And they go all the way back up. This is in northeastern Mexico, through Saltillo and Monclova. And they finally get over to El Paso. Once they get up to El Paso, they walk from El Paso all the way to the Pacific Ocean. All the time that these four men walk, nearly every day they're accompanied by Indians. They never once see a wilderness with no one living in it. Texas is full of people in 1528. There's no vacant land. The people are at war with, it, with one another in different villages and different communities all through this area, and he describes that. He describes in great detail that these people eat roots, and they eat cactus, and they eat these other kinds of plants. And he tells you that some of these foods they eat in huge quantities. Now. This, this slide just tells you these pictures up here are painted by a Spaniard who's up here in Texas and coming right down Highway 21 in 1828 and 1830s, and he's sketching Indians and describing Indians for the Mexican government. The people here are what we would call Bidai or Atacapan today. And if you know the country, there's Bidai Creek over here, and uh, there's Atacapan. This, th those words are fairly common words in Texas and Louisiana. Those were the native people here at the time that De Soto came, or uh, Cabeza de Vaca came through. And he describes these people. Those are the ones that are living mostly by root foods. So that a way archaeologists and anthropologists look at it is we say, can we characterize the landscape by the kinds of foods that it produces? And the post oak savanna, the folks here are called the roots people. And you see those bars that just says how important are the different foods. Deer are very important here and roots. Fish are important, not very much. And cactus, this, this term over here, big people, the figs, there's no prickly pear cactus anywhere in the world except in North America. Those prickly pear cactus produce the tuna, or the, the pear, as we call it. That pear is a very sweet, energy-rich, fat-rich in the seeds fruit, and Indians subsisted on it as a staple all over South Texas. He didn't know what to call the plant, but it looked like a fig. You know how a fig is kind of dark and it shrivels up when you dry it, and if, when you eat it, it's crunchy on the inside from the seeds? That's just the way the, the prickly pear tuna are. So he called some people the fig people because they subsisted in large measure on tuna. He called other people on the coast fish and blackberry. He didn't know the word for dewberry, but he used the word blackberry to describe what these people ate most of the time. <laughs> And he describes remarkable cooking techniques, all of which we've since replicated. He talks about people cooked in earth ovens, and that's going to be the featured cooking that I'm going to talk about here in a little bit. And that's like an underground barbecue pit. And he describes people cooking straight on the hot coals. You may not know it, that's me cooking big thick steaks. You build a fire, 
let that fire burn down to where it's white ash coating it and you lay the meat straight on those hot coals and it cooks and it cooks and you flip it over once and it, you, if you went to Outback Steak, you couldn't get a better steak or wherever your favorite steak place is. It cooks easy and it's not dirty, it's not gritty, it cooks like a charm. Then he describes, for the first time in the New World, the method of stone boiling, where people would heat rocks, red hot, sometimes dig a hole in the ground, or have a wooden bucket, or have just a, 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 a pouch of a, of a bison, or a deer, a stomach pouch, and suspend that from a tripod and fill it with water, and you drop hot rocks in that. Those red hot rocks cause the water to boil, instantly way faster than water boils on a gas stove or an electric stove. And, that, and he describes this technique. We've since experimented with it many times. But one of the things that, that, that I used to wonder is how in the world would you drop a red hot rock in a paper sack, for that matter, if you could make it thick enough, or a basket, or a rawhide, or a wooden box, and it not burn the box. It looks to me like when that red hot rock hit the bottom of the box, it'd burn a hole in it. Well, I tell my students all the time that the Indians didn't take physics at Texas A&M, but somewhere they learned a basic lesson. The kindling temperature of all of these things, the, the temperature at which paper will burn, or wood will burn, or dried skin will burn, is much, low, much higher than the temperature at which water boils. So, so long as you have water next to your container, the container can never burn up. And I saw this demonstrated in eighth grade in White Deer, Texas physics class. Maybe it was a chemistry class, but the chemistry teacher said, I'm going to boil water in a paper cup. You know those old Dixie cups that used to really be lined with, with paraffin? And if you put them in a fire, they just they burn up real quick. Well, all the students, being included, said, that's one of those dumb teachers. They think they know a whole lot more than what they know, right? So this dumb teacher pulled out the Bunsen burner, set it up on the little uh, burning platform, put a screen over it, and filled a Dixie cup, filled with water, and set it right there, and turned that burner on, Bunsen burner on, and that blue flame in the Bunsen burner lapped up there and boiled that water in the paper cup. And as the water burned down, the flames reached up and burned the top of the cup that didn't have water in it. But so long as you have water in it, you can never burn it. That's why you can cook a potato for a long time, or you can take ears of corn and put them in your oven for a long time. So long as they have moisture in them, they won't burn if you keep the moisture there. So, here's, there's, so, that's, so different ways of cooking. Here's an earth oven that I'm going to talk about. Think barbecue pit, we'll come back to it. The one on the other side is a wet version of that. You build this barbecue pit, you'll have the hot rocks on the bottom, and it's often called clam bakes. And you, you, the, the bottom of your oven's filled with red hot rocks, you've got a layer of clams or food on top of it, you dump water in it, and it steam cooks it. It boils it and steams it, and it cooks it very, very quickly. All right, here's griddle cooking. You heat rocks red hot, and you put food straight on top of those rocks and it's just like cooking on a griddle on your stove. And there's stone boiling. And this is stone boiling. You dig a pit in the ground, you line the pit with a hide. You don't really need to line it with anything. If you're going to dip the food out, if it's clayey soil, it'll hold the water. All right, so this is supposed to say, Cabeza de Vaca told us about oven cooking and he told us that they cooked these root foods for 24 hours and sometime 48 hours. So imagine cooking roots in an earth oven for 48 hours. We don't even conceive of that kind of cooking. But Cabeza de Vaca describes it. He doesn't tell us what foods, what root foods people are cooking, so that becomes a mystery. Which ones are they? Well, I happen to know when I came back to Texas from going to school in Washington State University that indeed people in the Northwest, Washington State, cooked roots underground in earth ovens for 48 hours. And I was fortunate enough to know and work with Indian people as an archaeologist and did some replicative experiments of cooking food, earth cooking roots in earth ovens for 48 hours. 
And we had found the remains of these earth ovens archaeologically, but we didn't really know how they worked. And at the time, and when I first started putting this talk together, I would always tell folks that, well, this, we're going to talk about a particular plant called camas, way up there in the Pacific Northwest. And camas is this blue flowered plant, it's a kissing cousin of onions, but it grew in densities of maybe 400 plants per square meter, almost one bulb touching another. And it's about as nutritious as an Irish potato or a sweet potato. And it grew in these high densities. That's me as a graduate student when my hair was a little bit longer some time ago, <laughs> learning how to gather these wild roots. But I was fortunate enough to do it under the tutelage of a Native American lady whose grandparents and great-grandparents back a hundred generations had cooked these root foods. And I thought they didn't grow in Texas. But I've since learned that Camas fields grew this dense in Texas, and I'll show you there right down at Brenham. But did the Indians gather the camas when it was flowering and easy to see? No. They knew that the energy stored up in any bulb plants, think a tulip or an onion, the maximum amount of energy is in that plant when the above ground plant's dead. If you're growing onions this time of year, the above ground part's dead, you've broken off the onion, it's laying over and the onion's continue, continuing to grow a little bit, but there's no above ground part. That's when all the carbohydrates are back in the bulb, ready to start life over in the spring. So you gather it after the above ground part's dead, when a normal person couldn't see a single plant. And that's why Cabeza de Vaca doesn't know what plants they're gathering because he's gathering them in the winter. One, he was a rich white guy who was being made to work like Indians, and Indian women in particular. So he phrased it as they treated us like slaves, which really they made him work for his living like everybody else had to, and he wasn't smart enough to be a keen hunter, so they put him to digging roots. And he thought that was the terriblest thing in the world and describes it to no end how it's hard work. But here's a bunch of archaeologists working in the Pacific Northwest now 20-something years ago. And we went out and gathered roots, and that's what they look like when you gather them. You dig them up, they're dry, they look like an onion. They've got an outer husk on it, but you don't want to eat that husk, so you just run in between your hands, and that husk comes off, and you see how these look like onions. They taste raw, they call them white, mucilaginous, tasteless. It sticks to the top of your mouth like peanut butter does. Doesn't taste like anything. But when it's cooked, they turn into sweet fig-like morsels. But you cook it for 48 hours. So here's how that's going to unfold. First, you gather up all of the bulbs. Then we wrap the bulbs in burlap sacks. In the old days, the Indians wove sacks from sedge or some kinds of plant material. Then you fold that sack up. Then you're going to cook it but we're not ready to cook it. We've got to build a fire. How long ago was it? That's my youngest son, and he now has two children of his own. So, so I've been working at this for some time. You dig a hole, you fill that hole with firewood, and the rocks that are going to make the heating element, the rocks are going to turn red hot and be the heating element, just like that bar on the inside of your electric oven. And that's going to generate the heat. And even though they didn't go to school at A&M or take physics anywhere in Texas, they knew that heat rises. So you wouldn't line the bottom of your pit with rocks. You would line the bottom of your pit with firewood and put the rocks on the top. So when the firewood burns and the heat goes up, it heats the rocks red hot. So you can see all the rocks embedded. That fire, that big, is going to cook 40 pounds of canvas. The Indian people built fires that were much bigger and cooked 1,000 pounds to 2,000 pounds of camas in one oven. Think 10 to 20 hundred pound sacks of potatoes cooked in a single underground barbecue pit. It was 12 feet across above ground and the earth was piled up 8 feet tall above ground. And we have sketches of that. That fire burns down, takes a long time to burn down. Once it burns down, those rocks are all in the bottom. Then you smooth those rocks out to make a smooth heating element so it'll generate heat over this large oven in a very similar kind of fashion. But you can't put your food straight on those red hot rocks, particularly those dried out sacks, because they would burn. So you want to put a layer of packing material, and you use green plants. 
This is skunk cabbage. You can use, I've used oak leaves. You can use prickly pear pads, anything that has a lot of moisture in it. And so that moisture, that keeps the plants from burning and protects it. So you lay the green plant materials over your earth oven, over the heating element. Then you add the food in the sacks. Then you cover it with another layer of green packing material. Now there's a secret that's some chemistry in this green packing material. The chemist has to cook for 48 hours to render it digestible. And it undergoes a process called hydrolysis, where a water molecule is forced into it. And here's another way to say that. Potatoes, we've probably all eaten a raw potato. You take a bite of a raw potato. I used to do it when mom or grandma was cooking the potatoes. And if it had been in the refrigerator, it felt good in your mouth. It was cold and it had kind of an interesting taste. But you could eat 15 pounds of raw potatoes a day and you'd starve to death. Starch grains are not digestible in their raw state. We have to heat starch grains, raise them to a boiling temperature for about 20 minutes. Then the little water molecules that are embedded inside the starch grains expand, break the starch grain walls down, and our enzymes can get inside and digest the starch. So raw potatoes, you have to cook 20 minutes to eat. This root food, you have to raise to a boiling temperature for 24 to 48 hours to render it digestible. So it's a big deal, long-term cooking. Cover it with that, then you cover it with bark. And that's Alice O'Connor there, the lady with the white shirt and the red hat. She's a Kalispell Indian woman. She's since deceased. But she's putting ponderosa pine bark over this earth oven. You remember the old uh, thermos bottles? There were glass bottles and they were lined with cork. That cork was an insulator. Ponderosa pine bark, yellow pine, longleaf pine, loblolly pine all over the south has real thick bark on it. And that thick bark is an insulator. So you want to hold the heat in because this fire's got to stay hot for 48 hours. So you cover it with that, then you cover it with earth. And that earth top is covering the oven. Then it's anticipation, waiting for this oven to open. And there are many accounts all over the, the Northwest where the kids hung around these ovens and when they opened them because it smells so good. And it just reminds you of the stories, you know, cartoons you used to see. Grandma's cooking the apple pie and she opens the oven and puts it in the window and the smell goes everywhere and all the kids gather. That was what was happening here. Only think about if you're cooking these great ovens and you're cooking a thousand or two thousand pounds of camas in one oven, you're going to have a lot of people. And so a lot of people came together to participate in this each year. And those people coming together, it's like a howdy dance. Boys and girls are meeting each other. And year in and year out, they'll, I spy that lady. She's a good root digger. She cooked the best camas. I'm going to come back and see her next year. So these times come when people sit around and commensurate about who caught the biggest fish or where the best hunting country is. But the real thing biologically going on is this courtship that's embedded. That's how systems keep going. This is the big uh, church gathering down on the Canadian River that takes place twice a year when everybody for 50 miles comes around and you see your sweetheart. This couple ends up, out of, out of this project, actually getting married. I don't know whether they're still married or not, but you can see the looks on their faces that they're probably thinking of something other than the tasty meal they're getting ready to have. That oven's now open. All of those green plants have lost all of their moisture, and in losing their moisture, part of that moisture that it's lost is organic acids, and the acids help cook when the acids are volatile and they turn into gas and all of those volatile organic acids go through the canvas, they cook it, kind of like cooking something in vinegar, in an acid. Things will pickle in vinegar and essentially cook. Well, that's what's going on here. You peel all that back and open the sacks up and those white mucilaginous bulbs have turned into sweet fig-like morsels. Now, people say, what does that taste like? And to me, it tastes like, once it's cooked, like a sweet potato that's a little undercooked, but somebody drizzled a little bit of molasses on it. And it's sweet. And if any of you grew up tending horses, you would know that during the winter, if when you're feeding horses sweet feed in a barn, and if you come in the barn, you open the door, you smell that molasses, and it almost wants a person to go find, where's that to eat? 
and really it's just a sweet feed, the corn dipped in molasses for the horses. But it's a good smell, and that's what that oven smells like. It smells like molasses when it's open because it has converted non-digestible sugar into fructose. And fructose is a natural sugar, and it allows that sugar to be digested very easily by people. And so everybody jumps down to get some of the fresh uh, camas that's cooked. Alice, the lady that cooked it, she's just pleased as she can be. By golly, we had a good cook-off. We didn't burn it. It's not undercooked. It's ready to eat. What do all these white guys think about it? Look at their faces. And you can see right off the bat that taste is in the eye of the beholder. And there are some acquired tastes. Some of those guys don't like it nearly as well as the other ones. So then what happens to the camas when it's cooked? That camas, when it's cooked, then is taken into loaves and crushed together, pounded together, and it makes a really thick, heavy bread. I call it hippie bread. And the holes in it, you know what those holes are in it for? It dries, and you're going to put sticks through those holes and hang it in your rafters of your house. When you hang it in your rafters of your house, it has a natural way of smoking, and it gets covered in smoke, and the smoke plus the sugar. You see how those are shiny? That's the sugar that comes out, and sugar is a natural preservative. It forms a barrier and won't let oxygen inside to allow decay. Smoke does the same thing. So there are natural ways of preserving. Then we excavated that oven. And there's the oven in cross-section here, and that's the rock heating element. All right, is there camas in Texas? Does this plant grow in Texas? You betcha. What do we call it? Some people call it Eastern Camas, some people call it Western or Atlantic Camas, and some people call it Wild Hyacinth. It's recorded in Brazos County. I've not found it in Brazos County. The best accounts that I have is up on the Red River of people cooking Camas here, and those are Comanche Indians cooking Camas, clearly described in earth oven in that process in the 1870s up on the Red River. I told you camas grows in Texas. I looked for 15 years for camas growing here, and one of my good colleagues in, the, in uh, rangeland e ecology, Fred Smine, said, go down to Brenham, and there's this place at Brenham where you can see some camas growing. And I went down there and I found it, and I photographed it, and then I came back five or six years later, maybe 10 years later, and the field was gone. And I was disappointed. I thought that was the last bit of camas in Texas. And all I had to do was turn around. See, that's the density. And when I turned around and looked at this field of camas in Texas, all of those blue flowers are camas. And you look at this up close, that's the blue flower camas. Those are seeds, the ones that are already in seed pods. This is about five miles south of Brenham in Blackland Prairie. And those plants are growing at over 50 plants a square meter. Now, camas is cooked in Texas beyond a shadow of a doubt. We have camas in earth ovens that goes back 8,000 years in Texas, where we found the remains of these earth ovens. In the Pacific Northwest, it only goes back right now for known ovens about 7,000 years. But what are some of the other plants? How many of you know spring beauty? It's a little pink flower. And sometimes of the year, if you see the right field in the right place, always grows in sandy soil, the ground will almost be pink. So how thick do wild roots go? Every one of those produces a root. A big one is no bigger than the end of your thumb. But you see there's a lot of them, and they're easy to dig. They're just very shallow under the ground. You can find them and dig large numbers of those very quickly. This one over here, that's false garlic. And you see this flower, it blooms multiple times during the year, and sometimes you can have almost white fields of false garlic. Sometimes it's called crow poison. And that plant grows, and it produces a, not really a bulb, but a corn. But it's maybe almost big ones as big around as the end of your thumb. But they grow in high densities. Over here, all it's, these Uritonians are edible, right? Every one of them. Onions, <clears throat> wild onions. A bunch of you have to have walked through fields in the spring, and as you're walking through the fields, you smell onions. And you look down, and, and you may or may not recognize the onions, but they're there. And they grow in very high densities. Both of these plants grow over 100 plants per square meter. And the onions, 
usually we think, well, who would eat a whole lot of onions? But here's the question. In your Sunday roast, or whenever you roast onions, what happens to a big onion when you cook it for an hour or two? Does it still taste oniony? No, it gets sweet as can be and turns brown. That's the sugar in onions. The longer you cook onions, the sweeter they become. And the people that I've talked to, I ask my dad and I used to ask my mother, did you ever eat wild onions? No, nope. the only thing wild onions did is in the spring when the cattle, the, the, the grass wasn't up, the cattle would graze on onions and it'd make the milk taste bad. That was all I knew. But if you talk to Indians about wild onions, some Hispanics, occasionally, they'll say, oh yeah, we used to gather wild onions, we cooked them all the time. And so these people who have deeper connections to the far distant past and what's to eat know about it. This, what's this plant over here? Wine cup. wine cup. That's what wine cup looked like the roots all winter long. And when that flower comes up and it puts the long vine on it, that root shrivels up and it's a little knobby thing this time of year. But in the winter, it's big as carrots. And I first dug those when I first started, we moved out in the country and I planted my first garden about 10 years ago. I dug up these and you know, I'm supposed to be Mr. Roots guy. And, and what is that root? What is that root? And I said, I'm gonna watch it. I don't know what it is. It's gotta be a carrot because of the way the leaf is. It's not a carrot at all. That's in the mallow family. How do we know mallow, marshmallow, sweet roots? That's marshmallow come marshmallow comes from a root, a mallow plant, and it's rich in sugar. And these are the wild ones. Here, this is rain lily. You've probably seen rain lily, a single bloom. It's toxic in its raw state, but once it's cooked, it's edible. Camas, and this one over here, that's greenbrier. Greenbrier that you walk through the woods and it's so thick and you try to kick your way through and it cuts your feet all up, cuts your legs up. Greenbrier put, puts roots on them. They're, they're rhizomes that are sometimes as big around as your arm and that's starch rich. That's just 100% starch on the inside and it's like cornstarch or arrowroot. All Indian people, all native people had some kind of wild starch to thicken their soup. And if you think, probably everyone in the room, somewhere in your house, there's some cornstarch or some arrowroot starch or some kind of white powdery starch that you thicken food with. Potato starch will be the same thing. This uh, green briar, when you crush the green briar up, the green briar, you crush it up, then you soak it in water and you, you rinse it and you take the, the, the pulp out and you let the water evaporate and you just have a white, pure uh, starch left. And you add that starch to your soup and it thickens your soup. Think if you're, if you're, you're eating a lot of soups and you're Native American, you don't have a lot of plates because you couldn't go down to HEB and buy paper plates, but you're eating these soups because that's the efficient way to cook. You want the soup to be real thick. And the soup really turns out to be almost like a, a gravy, very gelatin-like. And that way you can serve it up on flat wooden plates and you don't have to have a bowl. Very efficient way to eat. These just tell you the same plants. False garlic, how dense is it? If Indians are going to eat food on a regular basis and create an archeological record of lots of wild roots, you have to know that the roots have to be abundant for all of these people to process it for a long time. And we find firecrack rock, the heating elements from those earth ovens scattered all over. I'm gonna show you a little bit about those and then we'll wrap this up. False garlic at the top, onions at the bottom. They're growing densely. Here, there's all of these different plants. There's uh, rain lily at the top. There's another one called trout lily I'm going to show you. They've all been found archeologically in charred forms in earth ovens dating back 8,000 years. Here's one that occurs here. Most of us don't see it. It's trout lily or dog tooth violet. And sometimes it occurs very dense and it produces a big root. Here's another oddball. This is called globeberry. In the fall, you see these little, they look like pumpkins, and you follow the plant down to the ground and it produces great big tubers the size of a potato. It's a squash family plant. This is thick-leafed yucca, and thick-leafed yucca has a taproot on it, and that taproot is edible. So all of these foods, and I hope that you all know these foods, are around here. Here's one that grows very densely. This is in our yard. 
And this particular plant is called woolly stargrass. And woolly stargrass also produces a bulb. It's a corm on it that's a sizable corn. So all of these foods, here's another one, ground nut, it's a pea family, a legume, and it occurs here. A little more sandy soil. You've probably seen this one after rains. It's copper lily, and the copper lily can sometimes be quite dense. It's another edible plant. Archaeologically, these plants occur back 8,000 years in Texas, and the closer you get to the modern time period, the more dense they are found. So Indian people were using these for a long period of time. This is over at Lake Somerville, it's not Brazos County, but all around Lake Somerville are the remains of these earth ovens where you find piles and concentrations of burned rock. And it's really around town here. When we did work for Mr. Beachy out at uh, the, the uh, Veterans Park, we found the remains of these earth ovens right out here at Veterans Park. They're over on uh, Lick Creek, same kind. All around us, you go down to the river, you find this. How long have they been there? You look at the projectile points up at the top, those arrow points at the top are 1,000 years old. The big ones at the bottom are 10,000 years old. That's how long people have lived right here. In fact, people were living right here when there were mammoths here and elephants, or mammoths and mastodons. People were living in Bryan College Station 15,000 years ago. We're not the first ones by a long shot. Were mammoths, around here or mammoths were right here, right here. If you had been on top of the Welcome to Aggieland and looked out for one day, 12,000 years ago, you would have seen elephants. You probably would have seen elephants and mastodons. And if you had been up there 20,000 years ago, you'd have seen a third kind of elephant called a gonctothere. This is a super productive place. It's hot and sweaty, but it's a good place for lots of people to be. <laughs> so this is a lifestyle that has gone on for 10,000 years. And if you look at Bryan College Station today, those of you that know the woods, this picture has a key indicator of the most important economic resource in the post oak savanna for 10,000 years. And it's that deer blind on the other side. If you don't have an oil well on your property, you're going to have much better off leasing your property for deer than you are for raising cattle in your property. Now, what am I doing with all this information that, that, that plays a role? These complex carbohydrates, wild root foods, are much, much better for us than processed roots, than processed seeds, corn, flour, uh, corn, wheat, and rice. Those are, are great foods. They supply large numbers of people, but when we pre-process them and eat them as tortillas and flatbread, it creates all kinds of problems. So Indian people in particular who were eating wild foods until the 1870s and they were placed in reservations and from one day to the next they went from eating all wild foods to standing in line to get commodities. Processed flour, processed sugar, lard, and coffee. And that caused Indian people to have the highest incidence of sugar diabetes, cardiovascular problems, and obesity in the world. So Indian people, though they might not all like the way archaeology do things, I found success working with Indian people who have these high frequencies of sugar diabetes to say, work with me and let's redo some of these experiments and let's learn about how Indian people cooked in the past. And from that, you can take that story, take it back to your people, and in talking to your people, encourage them with cultural pride, ethnic pride, look back on the past and what was to eat. So in Bryan College Station, when you think about ancient food ways, think of those deer and what people ate, and then I'm going to pass around a sheet of paper and everybody gets to guess all of these plants. That's the last of my slide. Thank you. Yes, sir.